Uh, all right, this is super loud. Give me a second. Okay, much better. So thanks for the intro. Uh, yeah, it's true. I am a physicist. I don't admit it too often because then people don't take me seriously, right? Because if you didn't even study computer science, are you a real developer? So yeah, anywho, uh, I'm going to talk about what makes JavaScript web token secure. And so uh, <laughs> I think the previous speaker already said this, but when you're building front-end applications, there's so many things you have to think about. There's routing, performance, animations, keep keeping up with React cons. So there's a bunch of things you have to do, right? And, and often security takes a back seat, uh, which is obviously not cool, but it, it always happens. And there's like multiple methods of securing your applications, right? You can use cookies, tokens, uh, you can handle them differently. You can have no sessions. You can only do server side. You can use uh, Java stuff, web applets and shit. Um, but the idea is that security is difficult, right? It's a tough thing and it's not super accessible to learn. So uh, I'll talk about one of the popular methods of auth authentication, which is Java uh, JSON web tokens. I tend to prefer JSON web tokens because they're not super difficult in implementation. Uh, it's like, it's for non-computer science geeks like me who can understand it, but it's still secure at the same time. So who am I? I'm Siddharth. I work for this company called Auth0. Uh, Auth0 is this authentication security company, right? It's like, if you don't have security engineers, outsource it or more like use tools that already do that for you. Tiny pitch. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I post garbage stuff all the time. I also run this side company thing I call Frontend Army, where I do training mostly frontend stuff, mostly React these days. Cool. Back to JSON Web Tokens. So JSON Web Tokens, are I'm just going to call them JWT, are actually an open standard. So it was built by a few folks from Microsoft and people around them. And the, the paper is actually open. So you can read the research paper. It's surprisingly short. Uh, so you can read it. It's all open there. It's up there. And they kind of built it for a different reason, but it's been repurposed on the web for authentication or I should say authorization. So the first use case that they actually built it for was information exchange. So it's JWTs are a great way of transmitting information between parties, right? They can be signed, you can use uh, public private key pairs. So the idea there is you're always sure of who sent you this message. If there's a hacker in between, you'll probably get to know. Uh, and then it's been repurposed for the web for authorization, which is for a logged in user, you want to figure out is this actually the user or is this somebody else in between? It's a hacker or it's like tampered data. So should I give access to this route, this service, this API? This is, this is a snapshot of the problem it tries to solve. So have your user, you have your API server. This is the original connection. But sometimes somebody steals the token or somebody is impersonating your user, right? And that's the hacker. Sometimes it's just a man in the middle attack. They're tampering with your network. And your API server needs to be sure that is this my user or is this someone else? Right? That's, that's the problem that JWT aims to solve. Um, it does that by doing something called stateless sessions. So the idea is that these sessions are, need not be stored in your database like cookies. It can just live on the client side and get passed around. And this, this kind of leads to some interesting uh, vulnerabilities and also some interesting features. So I'm going to talk about all of them. But to understand how they're actually secure, because if it's on the client side, it's kind of just visible, right? It's like, if it's there, somebody can just do a Chrome extension and just steal it, right? So how, how is it secure? So to understand that, we need to understand the structure of a JWT. It's three parts. It's the header, the payload, and the signature. The header and payload are kind of dumb. It, they look like this. This is what a token looks like. It's all gibberish hash stuff. And I've color coded so that it looks pretty on black but mostly to signify what is the header and what is the payload. Cool, so um, you can also have JWTs without a signature. It's supported by the spec. It's not useful for security purposes, but it's supported, it exists. And we'll talk about it, it's important later. Cool, so the header is the metadata about this token. You have, you, there's only one mandatory field, which is the algorithm, so you say algorithm, and these are some of the nicer algorithms. You can use HS256 or RS256. And you can also use none, which is the no security part of it. Um, 
there are multiple other fields. You can say what is the type, like type is always JWT for us. Uh, you can say what is the content type. So the payload, is it a, is it a JSON object? Is it again a JWT, like you can have nested things. But for the most part of it, this, this is enough. Cool. And then, so to make that hash thing, you first JSON stringify it, and then you base64 URL encode it, right? Uh, this makes it secure for the web. So all of the exclamation, all the percentage sign, you hash them down so that you can pass them around. Uh, and this is what it looks like, right? Again, it's only encoded, it's not encrypted, which means if somebody has this, they can just base64 decode, and they'll get back the JSON object, right? So they can see your metadata, it's out there. Uh, next is the payload. So payload is the message you're trying to send. So again, it has, it can have any fields you want. These are the canonical fields. So you have the sub, which is usually the subject. And then you have the issuer. Issuer is with service issued this token. It could be your own authentication server. It could be the same API. It could be a third party like Auth0. Uh, what is the intended audience for this token? So for example, this token is only useful for the cart API. Any other API that you use it for should reject it. You have the expiry, you have the issued at, both of these are date time, and then you can have any number of custom fields. Like I have name, John Doe, and is he an admin or not? So that's, I'm gonna strip everything else. This is the useful part for my talk. And then you do the same thing. You stringify, encode, you get this ugly hash. Again, it's decoded, not encrypted. If somebody has this, they can uh, decode it and get the thing. So the, the core thing is, you can only use session information here. Don't try to put secret information like a password or a credit card info, right? Because somebody can decode this. Again, if third parties can read this, why, why is this even a good authorization mechanism? And that's, that's where we have the signature. That's the most interesting part. So to create a signature, you need the header, you need the payload, you need a shared secret for HS256, and you need the algorithm that you're using. So it's a function of all of these. Um, the secret is the most important part. So it's it's not your password that you use for your Gmail account or stuff. It has to be more, it has to have more entropy. So the recommended thing is you use a 256 bit secret like this. And you obviously don't hard code it. So I'm gonna read it from the process here. I'm gonna store it as an environment variable so that accidentally it doesn't get committed to GitHub. It sounds silly to say this, but it has happened in the past with people and companies have gone down because of it. So useful to mention. And to create a signature, you can use the crypto library. Uh, it's a built-in. Crypto here stands for cryptography, not cryptocurrency. So just, just sad that I have to mention it. Uh, so yeah, so you can use crypto library. You can create a HMAC with a, uh, HMAC stands for hashing for message authentication. And then you can use a SHA-256 to create the digest. So you pass the content. The content is a concatenated string of your header and payload, the hash that you have and then you digest it for base64. Again, you have to base64 escape it so that you can pass it around the web. And you get this hash thing, right? Now, this is not encoding, right? This is encryption. We're using the crypto thing to create an HMAC encryption, which means this is only one way. If you have the signature, you can't really decode it to understand what's inside it unless you have the shared secret, right? This is where all the magic happens. So. You can always have the answer to, have the contents of this message been manipulated, right? Did somebody change one of these data? Admin was false, did somebody change it to true? And we look at how. Uh, but first, the token is just, you just concatenate these three things, the header payload signature. This is what it looks like. It's separated by these dots in between. Cool. To do all of this, um, you can, of course, use a library. And there are like millions of libraries. So as Sham said, find a trustable one. So this one is called JSON Web Tokens. It has over a million downloads a week. So I hope it's secure. Like I know it's secure. A bunch of my coworkers work on this, so it's secure. Use this. And to use this, you say JWT. Oh shit, dude, that's the timer. Don't touch that. <laughs> I thought I'm out of time. Okay, so use JSON Web Tokens. Uh, you import it, and then you say, I'm gonna use the payload. I'm gonna sign it with JWT, pass the payload, pass the secret, pass the algorithm. Right? And then it gives you this whole hash thing, right? So it's like a nicer API, you just say sign payload secret, which is the algorithm to use. And you get this. Um, there's a whole playground that is crafted by Auth0. It's, it's on jwt.io. It looks something like this. You can put in your 
uh, token, if you put the secret as well, it's going to decode it for you, or you can put the secret and encode it, right? It's a good way to test your implementation while in dev. Cool, how do you use JWT? So whenever the user wants to access a protected resource on API, the browser should send this JWT, send this token using the authorization header, right? So it doesn't rely on cookies, it relies on headers, right? That's kind of important. So the first request goes to your authorization server. This again could be your own server or it could be a third party like Auth0. Send in the credentials, you get a token, right? This is the document that we'll use for the API. You send it to your, the API. Now you're not really sending the credentials, you're only sending this token. The API can verify if this token is valid and send you back the data. Cool. So how does this API server verify the token? That's the important part. So you have this whole big token splitted split it by like the dots. You get the header and payload, which are just encoded. So you can uh, URL decode it. Sorry, base64 URL decode it, JSON parse it, you get the uh, data inside them, right? So you see this was the uh, algorithm used. This was the payload, right? And now you can see the payload, but you have to verify, has this payload been tampered? Is this really coming from the original user? And to do that, you can just create the signature again, right? So um, we have the secret, we know the algorithm. The, the hacker doesn't, or the client doesn't really know the secret. Only the authentication server and the API server know the secret, nobody in between. So it's like the token is passed and the API server at the end can verify by creating the signature again, by using JWT again, and it gives you the signature. If the signature part of the token matches, you know it's legit. If not, then you mean something, something shady has happened in between. Uh, again, you can use the same library. You say verify, you give the client token, you give the secret, and you give the, op uh, you give the whitelist of algorithms that this API supports, right? So the API can actually support multiple uh, authenticate, sorry, multiple algorithms for different clients. So you give a whitelist. It's optional in the spec, but you should always give it. I'll, I'll uh, show you why soon. And then you get a function callback or a promise method, this both. You can see if it errors out, then it's been tampered. If it doesn't error out, you just get the data and move on. Cool. So again, you can read the contents of the token, but you, if you don't know the secret, you can't change it, right? So you can't really tamper it. Here's a quick example. This is the payload, admin is false. This is the token. If I change admin to true, the payload changes. But if I don't know the secret, I can't change the signature which means on the server, when you do verify, signature will not match. You know something shady has happened, you reject it, right? Okay, let's talk about the authentication methods. The first one supported by the spec is none, right? It means no signature. So you just say JWT sign, you give the payload, you give null as the secret, and you say don't use any algorithm, you sign it. Don't use that, please. Uh, use something like HS256, which uses a shared secret, right? It's, it's way more secure than none, of course. So you give the payload, you give the secret, you give the algorithm to verify. Again, you get the client token, you pass your shared secret, and you say, this is the algorithm uh, whitelist, right? Then there is RS-256, which is slightly more secure because it relies on a public and private key pair. The interesting part here is to sign it, you need a private key, which means the authentication server, the first one, needs to have the private key, sign it, create the token, pass it through the client, pass it to the API server, the API server doesn't need to have the same private key. It only needs to have the public key, right? Which means it's one less thing to protect. Only the, uh, what do you say? Only the authentication server needs to protect the private key. You don't have it on multiple servers, so it's slightly more secure. Um, the interesting part here is that by the virtue of its name, public key is public, right? So it means anyone can actually grab it from somewhere. You probably put it on GitHub and stuff. But the fun part is the hacker can verify if your token is valid still can't change it, right? So that's, that makes it pretty secure. The hacker can see the public key but can't do anything with it unless he has the private key. So it's all cool. Um, the last one is ES-256, which is a slightly more interesting take on uh, RS-256. It also uses a public private key, but these keys are typically smaller, right? So it's, uh, it's perfect because the signature created with them is also smaller. So the network payload that you have to send because you're sending this token on the header is also smaller. So it's slightly more performant over the network. So if you're dealing with low, uh, what do you say, bad networks, this is really useful. Uh, the trade-off over there is it's slightly slower in comparison. Actually not slightly, it's like at least five times slower usually in benchmarks. 
So if you have a bunch, if you have a lot of CPU, but your users use shitty internet, then you can use ES256 over RS256. Cool. Cookies, right? Uh, cookies are the more popular authentication method. So I just want to do a quick comparison here. Um, with cookies, you typically need a database, right? You have to store the cookie somewhere, right? The JWT, we don't actually store it. We just pass it through tokens. Uh, we pass it through the header, right? Which makes JWT stateless. If you're storing the cookie in a database, that means for every request you get, you also have to query the database so that extra work the server has to do, right? Extra requests, extra time, performance, etc. JWT is stateless, don't have to do that. Uh, cookies are vulnerable to CSRF, right? So cross-site request forgery CSRF is like when a hacker tricks the browser into thinking that the, web, uh, the information is actually coming from the same website when it's not, and they usually steal your cookies. So uh, what do you say? Uh, JWTs are not vulnerable to CSRF because they don't use cookies, but don't get excited. They are vulnerable to XSS, which, is, which affects both tokens and cookies. Uh, I'll talk about them soon. Sessions can be invalidated on demand with cookie because you store it, you can also delete it or you can flag it as invalid. With JWT, because you don't store them, you can't really do things like remote logout. So the the, what do you say, the good practice is to always have an expiration, right? So you give an expiration in date time, don't create everlasting tokens, create really short-lived tokens that expire on their own. So even if like, they basically keep expiring, you keep generating new ones. Um, it's useful to say that JWTs can actually be used at cookies, right? They're just hashes. So you can actually store them as cookies. You lose all these benefits. But if remote, instant remote logout is super important to you, or for um, some reason you really rely on cookies, you can use the same hashes as cookies as well. Uh, that totally works. Cool, so important security question. Can JWTs be hacked, right? Like everything else, yes. So the JWT spec is bulletproof. It's, it's really good spec, but a weak implementation can get you hacked, right? So JWT really get a bad rep sometimes. Like you see these articles where they criticize JWT for being a shitty algorithm, met a shitty authentication method, because implementing it is super easy, but implementing it in the right way is requires a lot more careful effort, right? So it's super easy to get started, but then you have to kind of follow some rules to make it bulletproof. It's a lot like CSS, right? You start it, looks easy. It's just a simple syntax, but on day three, you've completely screwed yourself. Cool. So the first attack I want to talk about is cross-site scripting because I said you are vulnerable to this. So uh, XSS is a attack where you basically insert. How do I put this? Okay, let me give an example. So uh, this is like a, the orange website where I'm putting a comment here, and the, in the comment I'm basically saying I'm saying yeah, nice post, but what I'm really trying to do is I'm inserting a script tag here, and I'm loading an image. In the image, I'm actually pinging my own attacker website and I'm passing the local storage token, right? So I'm basically stealing. And if the server doesn't sanitize these comments, right? Sanitize user inputs, they'll just store it. And when the next user comes in or when you open this, the user only sees nice post, but actually that code runs and then I basically stole their token, right? And this is like a super common, super old attack. Uh, the Orange website takes care of it, so you don't have to worry so much, but uh, because JWT are also stored on the client. They are vulnerable to XSS. Cool. More JWT specific things is if you use a weak signature for, if you use a weak algorithm for your signature, right? So these are the three recommended ones in order of more, more security. So HS256 uses shared secret. Um, RS256 is slightly more secure because it uses public and private key. The authentication server has the private key. That's it. The API server doesn't need it. It uses the public key. Uh, third is if you use a weak secret, right? If you're using HMAC with the shared secret and use a weak secret. Um, the funny part about HMAC is that these signatures are optimized for speed, right? So the verification is really fast, but the irony here is if somebody is trying to brute force your password, they can actually use the speed. It's going to take them less time to brute force it, right? So it actually makes attacks slightly easier. Um, so the spec actually says, like, this is the recommended thing. If you're using a HS 256, uh, what do you say, algorithm, the key should at least be 256 bit in strength, right? So you kind of need like very high entropy. Uh, super secret 007 is a bad password. 
lead password is like i don't know what i wrote there but yeah using like numbers and hash and like things that would work for your gmail password are just not as secure uh, when it comes to hmac so you kind of have to use a 256 bit which is roughly 32 ascii characters okay um the the last this one is kind of i introduced at the last moment which is if you're storing the token in local storage or as cookies um i call it the khuli tijori attack which is it's just there for someone to take right so number one if you can just don't store these on the client side don't store them in local storage just keep them in the memory and when the user refreshes create a new token right it can be really annoying to implement right so you the typical thing that people do is they still store it but they give it a very short life right so that by the time somebody can use it it's already puff gone um the other thing is keep expiring them and implement like a background authentication because otherwise it would be really annoying if every time i refresh the page uh, the page tells me sorry your session has expired click login go the whole reroute and come back right it's going to be super annoying so implement like a silent background authentication um or zero js kind of does that for you so use use just use open source libraries use good open source libraries that's important um the next attack is the next uh, mistake is reusing the same key across services this this is a really nice attack i want to mention this so it's called a substitution attack look something like this you have your two servers you have the client uh in the first service john do is an admin in the second one he's not an admin so you do the typical authentication thing you send your credentials you get a jwt right we're going to call this jwt1 and you use the jwt to access data from this this server right the typical method now ideally what you should do is when you're talking to service 2 you should send your credentials to service 2 it will give you a different jwt and you use this jwt to talk to the server right now if you're an attacker here what you will definitely try is what happens if i use jwt1 for service 2 right just to try to see if the implementation is right or not so i'm going to send jwt1 and if you're using the same secret for both the service it's going to check out right it's going to verify and it's going to work but the problem is jwt1 was for admin true right not for admin false so what the user can do is say i'm just going to pass admin true and your api server kind of relies on the authentication server to make this call to pass this data of admin true or false So if using the same secret it checks out and you basically are screwed so you have two options the first one is always mention the audience key right in the payload i mentioned this at the start you can mention who is this token intended for so always pass the audience and say this token is only valid for service 1 right and then if service 2 gets it checks the audience even if the signature is valid but the audience is somebody else it's going to reject it option 2 is just use different secrets um so even for the same payload it's going to generate slightly different uh, signatures so that so that doesn't match the recommended approach is just do both right use different secret and always use audience as a good practice cool uh, attack number 6 if you don't verify the algorithm uh you're going to get screwed so this is called a signature stripping attack it's really cool where this is the intended signature this is the intended token strip the signature right and i told you jwt supports non signature things right this is algorithm done and then change the header to algorithm none right so i've done two things here i've stripped the signature i've changed the algorithm to none because headers are encoded so i can decode them change them and switched admin to true now on the server when you do a verify right and if you're doing a client token and secret just verify these it's going to verify them based on the uh, algorithm and header right which is none so it's going to say okay this token is obviously not encrypted it's always true let's pass this along so the bug here is you should always pass a white list of algorithms right so sometimes this is again something i've seen this is like a lazy approach where you say i need to give a white list but i'm just going to read it from the header right because that's the intended uh, header right again if the if the algorithm if the hacker intercepts it and changes to algorithm none you kind of just shot yourself in the foot so always have a hard coded list of white list algorithms that only these are valid so signature stripping attack doesn't work anymore because algorithm none is uh, will get rejected part 2 of this attack is this is super interesting which is 
you can use the RS-256 key as the HS-256 secret, all right? Uh, this is similar to the algorithm none attack where the goal is to fool the verification, right? And check this out. So um, this token was created with RS-256, right? Which means you had the private key on the authentication server to create the, to create the token, right? Um, public key is used for verification. Now public key as the name reply, implies, it's public. So the attacker can get his or her hands on it. But it's okay because all they can do is verify. They can't really change anything using the public key. Unless. So this is what the verification looks like on the server, right? You say, this is the token. This is the public key, right? Verify. Can anyone tell me what's the bug in this right now? Now this is the verification. So on the authentication server, the one that generates the token, you need the private key. But on the verification side on your API server, you just need the public key, right? There's a very simple bug here first, which is, well, yeah, somebody said algo is missing. Yeah, so I was, I, I was testing you. Uh, yeah, so I just told this, you always mention the algorithm whitelist. So we're gonna say, these are the two uh, algorithms that this, API, that this API supports, right? There's still a problem here, which is, um, notice how the signature kind of looks a lot like what HS256 verification does. So it's like, in HS256, you'll do JWT verify token, shared secret and the list of algorithms. Here what you're doing is you're saying token, the public key and the algorithms, right? Which means there's, there's something weird in this map, right? So what an attacker can do is change the, change the algorithm from RS-256 to HS-256. Of course, do a privilege escalation by changing admin to true and then create a new token on the fly, right? So you create a new token Say I'm doing HS-256 with shared secret and give the public RSA key as the secret, right? So suddenly this is like a valid signature because it uses a secret, it uses HS-256 and on the server side, when you're doing the verification, you're just doing the same thing. You're saying use the token, use the public RSA key and these are the whitelisted algorithms, right? You see what the problem is here? The attacker can basically change the algorithm and because the function signature looks the same, can fool your verification into thinking, this is not an RSA-256 uh, signature, this is actually an HS-256 signature. And because it's in the whitelist, it's gonna say, okay, cool, I thought you're gonna give me RSA, but I also support uh, HS, so cool, I'm gonna take it, and it's gonna verify to true, right? The fix there is, if you can just use one algorithm authentication method across all your applications, right, pick HS-256 or RS-256 and stick to them throughout um, so that you don't end up doing the, uh, somebody cannot do like a substitution on you. If you can't, there are cases when you have like a generic server which has to support all of these, um, split them into two, right? Create two different functions to create, uh, to check for different methods. Create a decode RSA token, create a decode HMAC token, uh, RSA for RS-256, HMAC for HS-256, and based on what's in the header, send them to different functions, right? And then only put the whitelist in individual in one of them, right? So the, uh, the RSA token only has RS-256. And then when you send it, it's going to fail because it's actually going to check the RSA thing for the RSA one. Even if you're trying to fool it with uh, HMAC, it's, it's, the signature is not going to match. So split them if you have to use both. Um, other things are like, you can also use the algorithm. Okay. That's, that's good enough. Okay. Cool. So that's, I'm on 30 minutes exact. So that's all I have. These are the resources. You can go to JWT IO for the dashboard uh, to play around with it. Um, there's a JWT handbook. It's like a 120 page handbook, which has everything you can learn about JWTs. That's where I learned almost everything for this talk. It's on this URL. Um, it, these are long URLs. I've just put them on my domain. It's at sid.studio slash JWT. You can get all the resources. And yeah, if you like this, give me a follow on Twitter. Thank you. Um, do we take questions now or in the session? I have five minutes. Okay. So okay. how does this compare to uh, SAML tokens? To? SAML. I have no idea, sorry. Okay. <laughs> no problem. 
Uh, I have an another question actually. Sure. So uh, the tokens are actually created by the IDP, right? By the? Uh, the authorization server. Yeah. So the key which client sends out to the uh, authorization server, what actually uh, is is it oh. made of? Yeah. Um, you're talking about the credentials part that, let me go to the diagram. Just to make sure I understand you right. You're talking about this key, right? So this is like your credentials, right? This is your username, password, right? Like oh, sure, yeah. So this is like a vague way of saying that you need the credentials to get the authentication. The implementation details are very different. Usually what you do is if it's like a third party, then you redirect them to the third party using a, like a unique token so that it verifies the third party hits your own servers to verify, is this really your application that's trying to do uh -huh. it, right? Mm -hmm. There's like a handshake in between, between the authorization server and your own services. And if the handshake is successful, then it passes a token that can be passed. Back. Okay. So is it, is it, uh, basically, um, something like if it's a multi-tenant, uh, system, so are you, are you sending the tenant ID there in the key or are you saying the, the, the tenant ID? Oh yeah, totally. So, um, this is where the idea of if you have multiple services, then don't use the same signature, uh, sorry, don't use the same secret or same keys, right? Which also means that, what? which also means that if you have uh, multiple, what do you say, servers that multiple services of your own and you're using a third party to authenticate, make sure you always pass the audience claim, right? So that for every audience or every API server that you have, it gives you a different token. Uh, yeah. Hello. Uh, so, uh, if you are using a single sign on system like Google sign in Microsoft or, or let's say auth zero. Mm -hmm. So we would typically have a farm of thousands of servers and each would have an its own public and uh, private key pair. So the intended service, how does it know to use which servers public key in this case? Uh, you're saying the authorization server, how will that know which one to use? Uh, no, no, the, the, client? The, uh, the resource server basically. How, it, to oh, sorry. The API server. Got it. You're saying, how will the API server know which key to use? Uh, which public key to use for verification of the... Thing. Oh, sure. So, uh, the fun part is that this public private key is between the authorization server and the resource server, right? So when you create a new, uh, public private pair, you basically put one private key in your authorization server and you keep the pair of that, the public pair of that in your API server. So if you have three API servers, you actually create three different pairs and send, put the public keys in each one of them. And then in the authorization server say, for this one, use this private, for the second one, use this private, for the third one, use this private. Typically in implementation, how this works is, um, if you're using a third party, then you say, I'm going to create three services on their dashboard, CLI, whatever they have. And they give you the option of downloading three different public keys, which you put in the specific API server that you want them used. Right? So the API servers, if they're three API servers, which means there are three different resources. Uh, each one of them has only one public key, not all of them. Okay. Huh. Ooh, okay, I understand what you're saying. So when I say authentication, oh, sorry, authorization server, I don't mean authorization server instance, right? If there are five instances, doesn't mean you need five different keys, right? Because if you're load balancing, then they're basically duplicates of each other with the same keys. Uh, by authorization server, I mean, if this is like one, let's just call it authorization app, right? Authorization service. If it's a service, it has one. If you load balance, create replicas, all of them should have the same keys. Yeah. Yeah, right. Maybe I should just call it service instead of server. Good point. 